thanks to everybody for tuning in um, for this session on, uh, on uh, regulators and AI. Uh, I'm delighted to say that we have uh, a, a sterling panel of people to discuss this area today. Um, uh, the, the way we originated this panel was uh, about a year and a half ago, we set up the uh, AI and Regulators Working Group, a rather snappy title, but in recognition of the fact that in terms of the, the evolution of AI and in particular machine learning, uh, regulators had a lot to learn about the world and to learn from one another. And uh, we wanted to get together UK regulators to uh, and their friends to uh, compare notes and, and, and better understand uh, both how they should uh, respond to the use of AI in their, their, their sectors, their scopes, and also uh, how they could uh, better use AI themselves. Uh, and as well as uh, regulators, we brought aboard uh, a number of friends, organizations that we work with who also engage in this area, including the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, so we have four members of that group uh, with us today uh, to talk around these areas of, of, of AI and regulation. Uh, we have Helen Margits from the Alan Turing Institute. We have Stephen Hunt from the CMA. We have Michael Cheatham from the CQC and Karen Croxon from the FCA. Uh, all of them will uh, say a few words about their, their roles and their perspectives on this as we start the conversation, uh, but we're keen just to really uh, launch in and uh, just get talking around this. Uh, I would encourage people to uh, send us in questions. Uh, we're looking to um, uh, have a bit of a conversation ourselves and then, and then respond to questions. Uh, and uh, we've got through to, uh, I believe we're looking to round up sometime between 4.45 and 4.50. So, so that, that, that's how much time we have. So thanks to the panelists uh, and uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. The, the first of my softball questions to get us going is, is for each of the panelists, I, I would love to hear some thoughts on uh, how uh, AI is uh, an example of, of AI being used in your sector, in your scope, uh, and you know how it, how you, your views on how it's affecting your world. And, and Karen, could I look to you to uh, to kick us off, please? Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Simon. And um, I'll just say a little bit uh, for a moment, just um, to ground our interest in in AI and and big data and these techniques. Um, so I'm the Deputy Chief Economist, Head of Social Data Science at the uh, the uh, UK's financial regulator, the FCA. We're regulating a broad spectrum of firms across financial services in the UK. It's a very wide remit. It, it covers uh, retail, it covers wholesale, it's tens of thousands of firms. Um, so eyes in many, in, in many places. What are we really trying to achieve there? It's For us, it's about ensuring the markets are working well. Um, and, and this means protecting consumers, promoting effective competition that really works in their interest and safeguarding the integrity and resilience of the UK financial system. So that's the, that's the kind of frame really for all of our work and the driving, uh, the driving interest that we have. Um, it's a broad, complex agenda. There are, there are many touch points to big data, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, many questions and use cases. Some of these are about industries, uh, use of the technologies, and I'll give you a, an example or two of that in a moment. Uh, well, I think we're going to talk later in this session about our own use of this uh, to be more effective and efficient as um, policymakers and regulators. And that's something, uh, you know, very close to my heart where there's a, a world of opportunity. So um, my role is, is then to develop the scientific research agenda as part of a, a team at the FCA to uh, help to address these questions, keep us at the cutting edge and think about what does this all mean and, and how can it be used best for, for good outcomes. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the, the broad picture in financial services, like many areas of life, you know, AI is a prediction technology. We're all facing, uh, you know, myriad prediction problems day to day, uh, both as firms and as, as consumers trying to sort of meet our needs and navigate markets. In financial services, we've got, um, you know, firms and consumers often taking particularly high stakes decisions under considerable uncertainty, quite a bit of complexity sometimes. You need some judgment in there. Uh, but sorry, it's my dog. There's some judgment in there, but often also um, a strong element of prediction. So that's where the AI can come in and, and be, uh, you know, really effective. There are potential applications uh, right across the value chain um, from upfront marketing, pricing, credit assessments, uh, consumer decision support. So navigating those decisions, helping consumers there, right through to sort of more back office functions, risk management, fraud detection, uh, regulatory compliance, and thinking about that interface. 
Um, I think it's worth just, just mentioning a little bit of an empirical lens on this that we have from some work we did last year uh, jointly with the Bank of England. So how extensive and, and mature is the deployment of all of this currently? Well, um, we, we ran a survey you know, of some of the firms that we, we regulate. It wasn't exhaustive um, and the findings aren't, aren't necessarily fully representative, but I think they do give an interesting sense for de developments out there in the direction of travel going back a few months. We found that machine learning applications, they're certainly on the rise. About two thirds of respondents in this survey told us they were using it in some form or another. There were a number of live applications uh, out there already, and this was expected to more than double within three years. A significant proportion, it's worth saying, of the applications were still at the exploration stage, but we could see that firms were taking quite quite diverse strategic approaches to machine learning with some of some of the firms telling us that it was really a strategic priority and sort of putting putting uh, quite a lot uh, behind that and I, I think in other cases there were fewer applications at play inside organizations and less of a strategic focus the in terms of the business areas you know it spanned the front to the back office uh, retail banking and insurance stood out as being at the forefront uh, by subsector and then um, applications were more concentrated in some of the back office functions I mentioned, like risk management, like fraud detection, but also the uh, the customer front end. So thinking about chatbots and, and other AI powered uh, tools for customer engagement, that was quite a big uh, a bit a big story there. Um, and so there was some evidence of use uh, across a wide range of, of back and front office functions, but those are the, the kind of key points that stood out. Overall, I would say the interest in machine learning and applications was certainly there. It looked like it was, uh, you know, the trend was positive, but the picture was still very much developing. Oh, fantastic. Th thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, and then uh, let's carry on to the table. So, so Stefan, uh, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Simon. Uh, so, like Karen, I'll explain a little bit about um, uh, what the organisation does and, and my team before diving uh, diving in. So, um, so I joined the CMA about uh, eighteen months ago to set up a new data technology analytics function. Uh, so, um, uh, I lead a, a series of teams: some data scientists, data engineers, behavioural scientists, digital forensics investigators, focusing on technology markets, digital competition and just dealing with uh, complex data and data sets more generally. And what we do as an organization is uh, we're the UK's uh, competition and consumer agency. Uh, on the competition side, there's three main things that we do. So the first thing is um, mergers. So uh, our, our role is to take a look at mergers and if we think there's, uh, they're gonna potentially be uh, harmful for the UK, we need to consider them and then think about what we might do to um, potentially not allow mergers ahead or potentially um, changing them slightly. So, for example, um, uh, relevant to COGX, a lot of the large platforms, of course, buying lots of companies. So we, we'll, we'll be reviewing that. So, for, uh, for example, we recently looked at Google, uh, Google Looker, and there's a variety of other um, tech mergers right now. Second thing that we do is antitrust. Um, so uh, I'm sure we'll all be aware of the really large uh, commission cases against Google. Um, over the last uh, you know, five, 10 years. Um, we uh, um, certainly, uh, as we leave the European Union, the CMA will be responsible for the UK's part of that. Um, and there's a variety of other issues to the dominance that we'll be taking care of. And then the third thing on the competition side is cartels. So um, dealing with those. On the consumer side, we're doing a whole variety of different things. So uh, we're doing a lot of work with COVID-19 and a whole bunch of consumer issues there, in particular cancellation, so around flights, holidays, weddings, these kind of things. Um, also, um, a lot of work on detecting fake online reviews. So both platforms where uh, they've been uh, the trading, the buying and selling of fake online reviews, um, but also actually dealing with platforms themselves and the technologies they're using to combat uh, this, this harmful activity. Uh, another example in the consumer side is social media endorsements. So the idea that influencers might be being paid um, to um, promote things, but actually not being clear on, uh, on the compensation that they're receiving. And across all the competition and consumer, uh, we've got this markets function where we can look across our whole markets and consider whether there may be problems um, without necessarily holding anyone responsible. So a really good example of this is right now we're doing a very large piece of work into digital advertising funded platforms, which uh, as you can imagine is a particular focus on Google and Facebook. So that's, uh, that's what we do as an organization. So um, as you might be able to tell from that remit, it's particularly broad. 
So that covers uh, really the whole economy. So I'm not going to focus on any regulated sectors, but how does AI, um, how, how, how is AI affecting firms that we oversee? So I'll, I'll, I'll mention four different things, and actually uh, quite a few of them Karen's uh, touched upon as well. Um, so the first thing in terms of algorithms is uh, pricing algorithms. So there's been a lot written about the potential for pricing algorithms to effectively learn to collude or help collusion, and thereby rise prices and make, make um, consumers, uh, people in our society, worse off. Um, so this is obviously something that we need to be um, concerned about. There's actually a lot of debate as to whether this could be happening at all. Some people are, are quite convinced it is, others are quite convinced it isn't. But us as an authority, we need to be on top of the evidence, on top of the research, and making sure that we can move things forward if needed. Uh, a second major issue that we sort of, um, and to be clear, of course, uh, uh, a lot of this use of algorithms is very, very beneficial. And, and but at the same time, as authorities, we need to be concerned about where there may be issues. Uh, uh, another issue is how algorithms can change the choice environments that, uh, that we all experience online. So um, it could be ranking and listing algorithms. Um, so for example, if we go on to a, um, any kind of search website and we put something in and we, we uh, get presented with a bunch of things, or any other uh, website where um, choices can be framed in particular ways. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that we might be concerned about. Are people actually seeing what they uh, would like to be seeing? Um, might there potentially, could there be sort of discrimination or other kind of issues? So for example, there's some research done on job websites, whether people from um, uh, minority backgrounds or women are potentially seeing the same um, uh, opportunities that others are. A third area is marketing. Uh, and sort of targeting uh, more generally. Uh, this could, uh, you might be concerned about digital advertising and how advertising is being targeted. Again, there could be discrimination issues here, and there's been research uh, by Catherine Tucker, MIT, and others uh, on issues there. But another aspect of marketing is churn models. We might be concerned uh, if firms are doing things in particular ways to try and retain customers in ways where customers might want to be leaving. Uh, so one might be concerned about, for example, uh, gambling or gaming or these kind of things, if firms are doing things to retain customers when actually it might be better for them to leave. And a fourth area of focus on um, algorithms is broadly the removal of online harms. So I mentioned uh, fake reviews. Well, obviously, firms have got various types of uh, algorithms, artificial intelligence themselves, to try and remove fake online reviews. And there's a real question for us as authorities is, are those algorithms, uh, are they efficient? Are they uh, enough at what they're doing? Are they effective enough? So um, I hope there's a whistle-stop tour of the organization, what it does, and some of the things we're concerned about. Fantastic. Thanks, Steph. And I think it's one of the interesting things we've found through, through this working group is, is how, many, how much overlap and touch points there are between uh, the different regulators and their scopes and the like. Um, and, and this is especially important for us at the Information Commission's office where, you know, we are effectively a, a horizontal regulator um, a, in, in the same way as CMA is, and we're interacting with sector regulators. Uh, and, and very often our concerns around the processing of data and profiling or the CMA's concerns around both competition and consumer harm intersect with, with, with different sectors. So it, it, sometimes it's, it's financial services, sometimes it might be advertising, sometimes it could be other aspects of, of, of retail, business to business. And, and that interplay, I think, is, is challenging, but it's also where a lot of the fun is and where we're all learning a lot from the work we're doing together. Um, and talking of uh, sector regulators, um, I'm going to pass on to Michael now to talk about how, um, how what he's seen from the CQC perspective. Hi. So um, <coughs> first of all, I'll say what CQC stands for, Care Quality Commission. Um, and we regulate the quality of health and social care uh, across the entirety of England. Um, so we, we do that by um, registering. If you want to provide health and social care, or health and social care, you need to register with us. Uh, at that point, we will um, monitor you as a provider and we will go out and do inspections and do kind of Ofsted style ratings. So you'll see that if you go to our website, you'll see that um, lots of the providers we uh, regulate have ratings against them, uh, which are um, from outstanding uh, all the way down to to inadequate. Um, so we're, we're kind of, I guess, regulated, but we've got quite a lot of uh, variety within those sectors. 
um, we regulate people from uh, so you might be a uh, truck for hundreds of millions of pounds worth of turnover um, and uh, tens of thousands of staff, or you might be a single handed domiciliary care agency going out and uh, providing care to people in their, in, in their own homes. Um, and I think one of the reasons I'm, I'm mentioning that is that um, the, the way data is collected and flows across all of those sectors is, is, is very different. And that has, um, that has implications for how those sectors use AI um, and how mature they are with respect to that. Um, I sit within the Intelligence Directorate in the Care Quality Commission. Um, I lead the Data Science Programme. Um, and the Data Science Programme for us is largely concerned with um, figuring out um, how to uh, how to uh, target our regulation to where it is needed. So um, looking at risk in individual providers. Um, but the sectors where we're regulating obviously use AI as well. Um, and um, I, I think probably by by some way the most mature in, in the hospital sector, the bigger bigger sectors with um, l large amounts of resources and academic partnerships. Um, and um, the the example I'll highlight is the use of um, uh, use of diagnostic machine learning in diagnostic services. Um, so uh, th this is typically, although not always, um, uh, a supervised machine learning algorithm on labelled data of some sort, uh, often from medical imaging, um, to say whether you've got you're suffering from various conditions. Um, quite quite a few of those uh, tools are. Uh, uh, um, uh, are out there in, in, in use. Um, some of them uh, are much narrower than others. Uh, some of them um, uh, will look at only one condition and say with a certain degree of confidence whether a, a person is suffering from that condition or not. Um, other people will, other um, tools will look at a very broad range of conditions. So there are, there's at least one tool out there which will look at a chest x-ray and uh, say, um, with a degree of confidence uh, whether an individual is suffering from one of uh, something like 100 different uh, conditions. So I think um, that that's uh, an example of how AI is being used right now in the uh, health and social care sector. Um, yeah, um, I, I think one of the big questions for us is um, looking at how um, that AI is embedded in use within those organizations. So are these uh, diagnostic tools being used by um, clinicians and used to support clinician decisions or are they fully autonomous and um, kicking out decisions without clinician intervention? Um, I think uh, it's, um, it, it's uh, it's a key part of the regulation the actual to, to, to understand how um, how we can uh, use those al algorithms safely in the context of providing care for people. Michael, thank you. Um, yeah, and I think I'm sure we'll go into this later as well, but th this notion of, of the, the rise of automated decision making and, and you know what, what when an algorithm is making a meaningful decision, uh, when it's when it's purely guiding humans, and 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 where that grey that grey line is, is is, is probably a, a critical one for a lot of us here. Um, uh, Helen, as, as somebody who kind of is, is working with uh, many of the the members there in regulated work group, as well as be, as well as being part of the group as work yourself, uh, what, do you have any thoughts on this area? You, I know you have some thoughts in this area. <laughs> 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 sure. So, as Simon said, I'm from the uh, Alan Turing Institute, which is the National Institute for Data Science and AI, and I set up and direct the public policy program. Um, and this program, we, we work with government right across government on um, developing ways to use data science and AI to improve policy making, service delivery and regulation. So we started in May 2018, and by now we work with probably around 70 agencies in some form or another. But that includes quite a few regulators. And actually, we do attend the, the regulators working group that um, Simon mentioned. And that is giving us quite a good sense of the kind of common 
possibilities of, of AI for regulation and also the challenges that are occurring across regulators, um, and uh, including lots of the ones that people have mentioned. Um, so we, we have started to do some thinking about, you know, what, what, what are the common problems here? What are the common opportunities? Um, there have been lots of really good examples here, and I'll, I'll just sort of supplement that with a couple of, 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 of our own and just try and put them into sort of categories. So what can AI do for regulation? Um, they really fall into two broad characters and both have been covered um, by the other speakers. Um, so AI can be used, particularly in the form of machine learning, um, but also agent computing, which hasn't been spoken about so much, to build tools to detect harmful behavior, prevent harmful behavior, or to um, uh, understand um, uh, understand what, what harmful behavior would look like if some sort of uh, policy change was made. So there's kind of three areas there, measurement and detection. So at the Turing, for example, we have uh, a project on measuring hate speech. It's about detecting, measuring hate speech online and trying to develop ways to counter it, obviously. And machine learning and natural language processing are absolutely crucial to detecting various types of um, online hate speech. Ofcom uh, is very interested in that project. In fact, I've just been talking to them just now, just before I came on um, air. And uh, regulating any kind of online harm requires machine learning and, and, and LP now. Um, uh, Stefan, I think, mentioned various sorts of online harm, like fake reviews and misinformation would come into that category. So that's one sort of uh, area, measurement and detection. Then there's prediction and forecasting. Um, Karen talked quite a bit about that. Um, many regulators need to predict where there's going to be failure so that they can take action early and intervene um, in some way. So I guess you could say that any inspectorate um, could be using AI to predict, to identify, it, I don't know, be it schools or hospitals or care homes or even gas pipes, to identify um, where inspection resources should be targeted um, to prioritise um, uh, institutions that are vulnerable in some way. And then the simulation and evaluation, and we're working in, uh, on this in various ways at the Turing, agent computing models can be used to kind of simulate um, the effect of new regulations and understand kind of harm at the system level, like a rigged market in the financial sector, for example. Um, so those are the kind of tools to use AI to be more efficient regulators and to deal with a world that is using AI, which is pretty digital, AI-based platforms are pretty ubiquitous now across markets and society as Karen mentioned you know a big uh, portion of uh, firms for example are using AI um, but the, and the other questions are about kind of where you need new rules or new regulation um, those questions of ethics and governance the kind of should questions um, a, a couple of the other speakers have mentioned that but that is another kind of key area, and that's difficult. What can you expect of companies or, 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 or platforms in, in this world? And we're doing quite a bit of, of work on that, and I'll just mention a couple of uh, examples before, before I stop. So um, one of them is work we're doing with the uh, Information Commissioner's Office, with Simon and the ICO, on explainability. Now, the project underpinning that work came about as the result of the Hall and Presenti uh, report on growing the AI industry in the UK and the government's AI sector deal, which actually tasked the ICO and the Turing to work together to develop a guidance to assist in explaining AI decisions. So that project is about kind of eliciting public preferences about what people expect from explanations of AI decisions about them. Um, the report comes out a couple of weeks came out a couple of weeks ago. Do have a look at it. That's based on on two five day citizen five day long citizens juries in in Coventry and Manchester. You know where the the citizens on those juries deliberated with the assistance of expert witnesses who gave them sort of the background information, which on a day to day basis we don't have time 
to kind of absorb the technical, legal, ethical dimensions of AI and, and kind of what can be explained and what can't be explained and that kind of thing. Very interesting results there. Do take a look at it because it shows the very different things people expect, for example, of medical care and financial services, um, such as life insurance or something like that. Um, but anyway, the, the idea of that was to produce guidance, what Simon called a horizontal guidance for how explainability should be built into data science models. And finally, we've also been working um, with the FCA on, on, because as well as horizontal guidance, you need sort of sector specific analysis to understand how um, models can be built in, in, in individual sectors. Again, Simon mentioned that. So we've got a partnership with the FCA um, to look at, again, at explainability, but explicitly for um, financial services. You know, take tr transparency. Why, why do you need transparency? What good is that to individual citizens? Um, well, for example, two things it can and help citizens to do, it might enable them to challenge the basis of outcomes. If, if they know, for example, if they can be clear what information or what data has gone into a model, they might be able to be assured that it's correct. And then say they were being rejected for a loan or something, um, they, they might be able to understand better um, why they, they had been refused a loan or whatever, um, if it was based on credit worthiness. And then there's the question of whether it allows them to kind of make informed choices about their behaviour. So say you've been um, or, or you're considering taking out a loan. It's worth you knowing that it's your credit score depends on the frequency of late payments. That allows you perhaps, you may not be able to, but it might allow you to change their behaviour. So there's just a couple of examples. It's a question of developing kind of expertise horizontally, as, as, as Simon mentioned, and also this kind of vertical um, in, in, in individual sectors, which all, all the other speakers have such expertise in. Thank you. Helen, thank you. And one thing I think is worth mentioning is uh, it's the different time horizons we're looking at here. I, I think uh, between us on, on this call, you're getting a flavour of, of some very immediate challenges and we're going to go in a second to how how the different regulators and are, are responding to those those practical challenges uh, and then going into the medium term uh, i was uh i was lucky enough to share a session with kathleen ross of the regulator horizons council earlier today um and they're tasked to really look uh, at a slightly different time horizon uh, a bit more strategic a bit more structural a little more medium term as to what the uk regulatory landscape looks like in the future and that that i think will be a really important process as well because we all recognize the world is changing changing the way data is being used is changing and uh you know our, our old ways of regulating need to evolve to keep up with that on that note and i'll go around in the same order as before in terms of karen stephan michael helen uh we've only got about 15 maybe 20 minutes left so i want to get a couple of some we've got some excellent questions I want to get a couple of those questions in but in a couple of minutes each could you just talk a little bit around um, how this evolution of AI in your in your sectors and areas is affecting the actual regulate how you regulate? You know, are you changing the the way you actually interact with your markets and your stakeholders in response to uh, in response to the use of AI? So, Karen first. Thanks, Simon. Um, so, look, I think. It's broadly, uh, this is uh, this is shaping the way we regulate in in two big ways, um, and and some of the others have touched on this uh, uh, topic as well. So, on the one hand, you've got industry using uh, embracing the the technologies, embracing big data. You, you know, we're an economic regulator that's shifting potentially, but not always the the economics of the market. So, how those markets are actually functioning. Um, and and then in addition, they're raising some important ethical questions um, and not always entirely new ethical questions, but they may put a different slant on things and require a step back uh, and working through an ethical issue. And um, at the same time, you know, in all of this, there's a big opportunity for us as regulators and policymakers. Uh, you know, we have access to inc potentially incredible data from across the sectors that we regulate. Or if we're horizontal, you know, we can do broad sweeps and, and bring in very granular data. We can link up data and then we can deploy exactly the same techniques and technologies, advanced statistical analysis, prediction, agent based modeling, the whole spectrum of, uh, of techniques. We can marry the social sciences on one hand widely you know construed with with data science um, 
and um, and to use all of that to develop more powerful evidence-based policy making and regulation and just operate more efficiently for a given regulatory regime and how we execute against that and make sure that uh, you know it lands well in the market and delivers the right outcomes and so I think this is you know it's a world of, of both opportunities and challenges as, as uh, you know our other uh, panelists and work group members have, have commented on as well I think on the firm's use of big data and AI it's raising it's shaping the way we regulate because of some of the questions it's raising so Helen talked about our collaboration uh, you know on some of these questions so we're interested, for instance, in explainability of algorithms, but uh, it's interesting in the abstract, but it becomes very important, I think, to unpack that, make it real world and think about what explainability might usefully mean for different types of stakeholder from the consumer through to, uh, you know, those accountable for outcomes um, inside organizations. Uh, so we have work going on there. And part of it's about development of frameworks and engaging across the ecosystem uh, on that and many other questions. And part of it's about empirical sort of analytical research informed by ethics, but also social sciences in big data um, to really get the evidence base together to, to shape our decision making. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are questions about algorithmic um, fairness. There's just one more example where where you're taken into a world essentially, you know, inherently philosophical. What what is fairness? What does it mean for a specific context? Again, bringing it down to the real world, unpacking that, but taking it to the data and applying statistical approaches to understand, for instance, what happens when you switch. Uh, prediction technology from traditional uh, linear models uh, in credit scoring to more machine learning based models, what happens to accuracy for the consumers, what happens to fairness defined in particular ways. So there are, there are, there are plenty of um, interesting applications, important ones to understand because of the opportunity and because of the potential risk. Um, I haven't mentioned consumer decision support very much, but that's something very close to my heart. I think we're all out, out there navigating uh, some quite tough decisions, particularly in financial services, but you could say the same about healthcare, um, welfare, important domains where there's uncertainty, potentially long horizons. Uh, we have our psychological biases and limitations. We're busy and I day-to-day -day lives, some are more vulnerable uh, than others and require particular protection. And there, too, you can see the deployment um, of techniques from AI and potentially giving a predictive edge and getting the right support in a timely way to really vulnerable people and the rest of us. And, and also, you can see some risk. You can see some risk of getting it wrong. You can see some risk of serving the average and not the tails of a distribution that may have particular needs. Um, and so you can see some issues to be worked through. But always, I think, one, one thing I like to keep in mind is the counterfactual. Um, so we, we're not in a world with perfect decision support offline or through human channels. And I think um, it's always important to think about what the trade-offs here are and, and just trying to move the ball forward towards better outcomes in our use of these different technologies and our regulation of them. And then just to, to finish by talking a bit about how we're using uh, some of these techniques and the big data internally. Well, it's really very important for us. It has been for a while. Um, and becoming more important. Our approach is, is very much these days, uh, I would say interdisciplinary in my area. Uh, you know, um, I have a number of teams that uh, span the social sciences and data science now, um, a behavioral science and design unit. I have a team that's focused on household finance, economic data science, financial stability, bringing in the big data sets. And then uh, recently I have established the social data science unit, which is which is all about integrating the wider social sciences with data science for our, our policy making. We are um, we're engaging very heavily with interesting questions bringing big data sets, linking them up, de-identifying them and tracing people through systems to try to make sure that we can uh, get support to them or ensure it gets to them at the right time. Part of that's just pure prediction. Sometimes you need causal inference. You need to really think, uh, uh, have mechanisms for understanding your likely policy impact. Sometimes you have an ability there in your own policy work to think not just about the average consumer increasingly, but also the, the, the heterogeneity there, the distribution of consumers and some of the techniques uh, that are coming on stream allow us to do that uh, in big data. So it's a very, um, you know, it's a very exciting agenda, actually, I think, from a welfare point of view, but has to be navigated quite carefully. Um, and I think for us, a big part of it is also the stakeholder engagement, looking across the ecosystem, um, making the best use of our sort of collective resources and intelligence across the regulatory community, um, but also working very much uh, with, with industry, uh, where I think the, the focus is very much innovation in, in uh, you know, the interest of consumers as well. Brilliant stuff. Karen, thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on quickly to the times. Over to you, Stefan.
Uh, thanks very much, Simon. Um, so I'll um, I'll try and sort of whip through a little bit how um, how uh, AI is affecting the CMA. And, and actually, uh, first of all, I'll say it's uh, I'd say it's much broader than that. In that it's AI, but it's also how firms are using data, how firms are using various different types of technology. And as you can imagine, of course, that's affecting. Um, so, for example, we're we're um, one of the main firms focusing on. Um, uh, the big tech firms, you, you know, these forces are affecting uh, these markets hugely, uh, affecting the CMA hugely. And that's really the um, the reason for setting up the whole uh, um, the series of teams that I uh, I oversee. And we're, so we, we've set up, we've been going for, um, coming up for 18 months now. Uh, we're, you know, um, well established, we're almost a, a full size. We're really plugged across the whole of the CMA's portfolio. So, working uh, when I talked about all the competition and consumer work that um, we talked about earlier, we've, yeah, I think uh, every single case I mentioned, we, we're, we're plugged in. So, focusing on artificial intelligence um, work in particular, um, I, I listed uh, four different types of algorithms cases uh, that we might be working on. So, by saying so, you know, the framing of choices, ranking and listing in particular, um, uh, also mentions of marketing and targeting and, um, a a and other things as well. And we're really working across all of those and thinking about all of those. And those, in fact, uh, affect our um, markets work, our consumer work, our antitrust work, our cartels work. Uh, algorithm cases affect all of those. On the data side, we're really thinking about the value and the impact of uh, data. Um, and there's lots of really quite tricky uh, and fascinating issues. Try, for example, the value and impact of data in mergers. How do we think about um, the potential implications for uh, if a firm buys another firm, the implications for them being able to merge and join data sets? Um, or, um, what about the potential of foreclosure, for example, whether there's uh, a firm buying the other firm, the data of the firm they're buying can actually be an input to other firms. How do we deal with these kind of issues? Um, focusing now on technology and these kind of things, well, we're trying to understand uh, developments, for example, in privacy enhancing technology, um, developments in, say, interoperability and the use of APIs, uh, and maybe what we need to do to develop things. And so this is a really integral part of uh, the digital advertising market study that I mentioned earlier. This is one where we're really thinking about how privacy enhancing technologies can make a difference. We're really thinking about how um, interoperability could affect, say, um, social media, um, Facebook and other companies, but also could be affecting um, maybe some kind of the, the, uh, the data that Google and others have access to. So there really there's just huge implications for the CMA um, for, um, you know, for the kind of things that we're talking about. Stephen, thank you. Michael, over to you. So um, think about the impact of AI on the providers we regulate. Um, in, in some ways, the underlying principles of, of what we do when we go in and, uh, and regulate uh, don't change, but there, there's an awful lot in the detail that we need to um, work through to understand that we're, we're um, correctly understanding how how providers are using using ai and and what i mean by that is um if you want to uh do the job of uh having an algorithm play a part in the um in in diagnosing a, a particular condition for someone um you'll need to have that registered as a medical device and go and uh have it registered with mhra um what we're concerned with when we go out and um, inspect providers is are they using that algorithm appropriately in accordance with the manufacturer's guideline or the the, the, com the software company's guidelines um, and do they understand that it is appropriate to use it in their setting so um, algorithm, algorithmic bias has obviously been mentioned already we're, we're particularly concerned um, across um, uh, different hospitals provide, serving different populations, whether uh, the, uh, the the use of a particular algorithm is appropriate for that population, and, and particularly how the provider understands that and is demonstrating that it's, it's appropriate for their population. 
We're also interested in uh, the question of how well the provider understands what they're doing and whether the clinicians um, and people using the, uh, the, the, the various tools that they have um, understand the limitations of what they are looking at. Um, and uh, I gave examples of narrow and broad focus, particularly with, the, with um, things that look across a much broader range of conditions. There's much more opportunity for a uh, clinician to not have the, the entire picture of, of um, how an algorithm uh, works and its particular biases and weaknesses um, in his or her head. Um, so that's for the providers. For our, us as a, as a regulator, the, the key question is um, where are the risky providers? Where are the providers um, that uh, we are concerned about? Where can we go and target? Um, we have a couple of uh, models running in different sectors. And again, the, the heterogeneity of the sectors um, is relevant here because we can't do this across all. Or it's very challenging to do across all sectors um, to uh, look at risk based on um, predictive risk, essentially. Um, we're, we're also, we, we receive massive amounts of uh, free text data and um, one of the main, uh, the, the other main challenges that we have is uh, helping our uh, inspection workforce navigate and uh, signpost that uh, free text data in a way that flags up the um, meaningful stuff, which means they need to take action and separates it from uh, things which are um, less urgent or can be looked at at the next inspection. Michael, thank you. Oh, I'm going to apologise now to everyone on who all the virtual attendees, because I've got a feeling we're not going to get a chance to get through to questions, which we very much wanted to do, but it looks like we're going to run out of road. Um, we originally thought we had an hour for this session, but we only have the, the 45 minutes plus a couple. So, um, Helen, over to you for, for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, just to wrap it up, really, I mean, one of the things we noticed when we first started the public policy programme is how um, things seem to sort of things seem to always be approached in a kind of bit of a siloed way in government. You know, for example, if if, if Bayes has a problem, it, it tries to resolve it with a solution that was previously developed in Bayes in the same department. And yet we've noticed that AI challenges tend to be best resolved with solutions developed somewhere else. If, you, if you're trying to identify vulnerable groups, for example, or, or vulnerable groups of people, it probably doesn't make sense to look at a model for vulnerable firms developed in another part of the same department. It's better to maybe go to the Department of Work and Pensions or something like that. Um, take the explainability challenge. Um, you, you know, we found it really helpful to sort of do that work with the ICO and then develop it and build on it um, when we were working with the FCA. So I think what all the talks have shown is that it's really crucial for reg all regulators to have access to data science and AI expertise. And that can be kind of hard for, for smaller regulators in particular, not for the um, very, very um, substantial ones talk, talking here. So I think there's a lot of thinking to do about how it might be possible to build kind of common capacity in this challenge, um, both in terms of building tools. I mean, take detecting online harm, for example, just really broadly defined. Um, a lot of regulators need to do that. Um, so there's a real kind of possibility um, to build up methodological capacity there. And then take the question of, sort of the new tasks for regulation in a data intensive world where AI is being used to innovate bad. We tend to think innovation is a good thing, but there's plenty of sort of bad innovation going on. I mean, in France, for example, the government sort of recently banned the use of machine learning systems to identify the judges who are most lenient. Um, and that kind of thing is sort of things that you wouldn't necessarily have, have thought of unless you have a good look at what's going on. So I think this question of, of how we build capacity in AI regulation, the regulators working group is a really great start there. And um, at the Turing, we are trying to think with the regulators working group what it might look like to have that kind of capacity to build that kind of common pool of expertise in such an important task. Thank you. Helen, thank you so much, and, and and very elegantly landed, but bang on time for us. So um, it, it just it just seems to me to to round up a, a little bit. I think um, I I think that there's some themes that have come through from all these discussions. I think hopefully we have outlined to the audience on one level 
uh, how very different uh, the uh, the experiences and the um, uh, and the approach to different regulated scientific sectors. But underlying this, there's there's, there's ongoing themes that I think are very uh, you know, very consistent around transparency, around fairness, around ethics, and around the different opportunities to 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 use AI as well as respond to AI in these different scenarios. Um, and I think one of the things that's come through in this second round of questions, especially, is this question of of of, uh, of maturity, of, of maturity in terms of how different actors in a regulated space are, are using AI in different ways, but also different maturity of different regulators, <clears throat> large and small, and how much we have to learn from each other, and, and the work I think we we have to do as a community of regulators to uh, to develop. Our own capacity and to actually continue to continue to evolve in these markets is key. Um, so uh, it just leaves me to to thank everybody. So uh, huge thanks to Karen, Stefan, Michael, and Helen for uh, for participating uh, and sharing that their insights with us. Uh, thanks very much to the cheering for inviting us to to, to their virtual stage and to uh, Cogex uh, for organising these things and Michael, the director backstage for for managing this for us. And thanks especially to the audience uh, for listening. And apologies again for not getting to your questions, which were excellent. Um, but I hope you've still found the, the session useful. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.